definitely going from the old outdated technology of, of, of using cows to make protein to using things like soy to make protein reduces the amount of land and water required. But and and that's a good direction to go in. And then we're taking it the next step and using a process that does not require any arable land, any agricultural land at all. Um, and the overall footprint, no matter where you put the production, the probiotic production process is much smaller. And so the a comparison is uh, it would take a soy farm the size of Texas to give you the same amount of protein as you'd get from an air protein farm the size of Walt Disney World. Welcome to the Business for Good podcast, a show where we spotlight companies making money by making the world a better place. I'm your host, Paul Shapiro, and if you share a passion for using commerce to solve many of the world's most pressing problems, then this is the show for you. Welcome to episode 37, friends, the first Business for Good episode of the Corona in America era. I'm recording this from Sacramento, California, just minutes away from where one of the first diagnosed cases of coronavirus took place in the country. Since then, numerous events at which I'd either been scheduled to speak at or at least would have been attending have been canceled. There have been countless other societal disruptions, not to mention, of course, the horrible toll on both human suffering and death. Of course, this is certainly not the time to look at how your 401k is doing. That is, unless you happen to have a large stake in Zoom, the video conferencing company that's, well, Zoomed in stock price as a result of Corona. In fact, I'd go so far as to suggest that even independent of the public health benefit that video conferencing technology enables during an outbreak like this, just the environmental benefit alone of all the averted plane flights would seem to make Zoom quite the prime candidate for a business for good profile. Perhaps that will be a future episode, but As for this episode, I have to say, it really is one of the most fascinating and promising companies I know of, and one I'm proud to be presenting to you today. You likely already know that animal protein takes a vast amount of resources to produce. That's why there's such a need to switch to plant protein or perhaps even animal protein grown without the need to raise and slaughter whole animals, also known as clean meat or cultivated meat. But there's another category of protein now altogether one that our guest in this episode calls air protein. As you'll hear, Dr. Lisa Dyson was reading 1960s era NASA research about how to feed astronauts on long-term cosmic trips. She gravitated, pun clearly intended, to one idea, growing protein not from animals or from plants, but rather right out of thin air. Sound like science fiction? Well, Lisa and her team at Air Protein are already doing it, and they've recently even made what she calls air-based chicken. The photos online of this air-based meat look truly delectable, and I, for one, cannot wait to try it. Lisa asserts that her air protein takes a tiny fraction of the resources needed to produce even plant protein, which is a driving force motivating her to commercialize her air-based meat in the near term in order to save the planet and animals who call it home, including us homo sapiens. And speaking of homo sapiens, of course, stay a reasonable distance away from them for the time being. Whether you're listening to this episode, buying stock in Zoom, or just going about your day, social distancing, it's the new big thing and with good reason. So stay at a safe distance away from other people and prepare to be as impressed by Lisa Dyson as I am. Enjoy. Lisa, welcome to the Business for Good podcast. Thank you so much. Really wonderful being here. It is so cool to talk with you. I have wanted to have you on the show for some time, and I was so grateful that we got a chance to meet in person at the Rabobank event so that I could finally rope you into being a guest on the show. So I have a lot of gratitude (laughs) to Rabobank for making that happen. Well, I'm very excited to be on the show. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's get started. First and foremost, uh, there are two companies, right? There's Coverti and then there's Air Protein, which was a spinoff. But what does Coverti mean and when did you start it? Wonderful. Well, Kiverti actually, the the first part of the word, ki, is inspired by the Japanese word for energy, kind of like chi uh, in Chinese. And then the second part of it is verdi, which means green in Italian. Hmm, so green okay. energy. Green, green life energy. Force. Very cool. Yes. Okay. Awesome. That's what Coverti means. Very cool name. But air protein is what we're chatting about today. And tell us, it's pretty self-explanatory, but uh, for those who aren't really familiar with what the heck it means, air protein, I mean, I breathe air. Am I getting protein that way? I doubt it. But tell us, what is air protein? Yeah, well, it is just as the name sounds. We make protein from elements of the air. And that protein is then used to make delicious foods, such as meat alternatives. 
Okay, well, before we get into how you're doing it, because that sounds like complete sci-fi, and I, I have learned a lot about uh, sci-fi type companies, but this seems the most sci-fi to me. So before we get into that, I just want to talk about you because you have a, a very impressive background. You're a Fulbright scholar. You have an M, you have a PhD from this uh, little school that a few people have heard of called MIT, um, and your PhD is in uh, theoretical physics, studying quantum gravity. That sounds cool to me, but I got to say, Lisa, I don't even know what quantum gravity is. So tell us, <laughs> what, what, is, what is your dissertation about? What's quantum gravity? Oh, my dissertation. Well, actually, it was about rotating black holes, time travel, and cosmology. But quantum gravity is basically how do you unify this theory of quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, how do you unify that with the theory of large things, general relativity? And I studied a specific uh, theory called string theory, which is a way to unify both. I read Brian Greene's book and I still felt like I wasn't really comprehending string theory. <laughs> I, I think that had more to do with me than with him, though, I, I believe. Oh, he's a wonderful explainer to me. I love uh, I love that book as well. I believe the one that you're talking about. Yeah. And Elegant you know, Universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Elegant Universe. That's right. Yeah. And he, ha uh, he has a lot of personal passion for this topic, too. In fact, I, I believe that he happens to be vegan for animal welfare and environmental mm. reasons. Uh, as I was, so I, I heard an interview of his one time as uh, he was talking about. So um, it would be interesting to see. Uh, does he, is he familiar with what you're doing at Air Protein? You know, I didn't know that he was a vegan, but that is becoming more and more uh, popular for people mm -hmm. to reduce their in, their meat intake, in particular their animal intake, because of the environmental consequences. So I didn't know that about him. Yeah, yeah. Well, I bet he would think that what you're doing at Air Protein is pretty cool. But um, there's actually a connection, though, between your interest in <clears throat> theoretical physics and, and astronomy and what you're doing now, right? So this research that NASA was doing back in the 60s, tell us about that, how you came across it, and how it inspired you to be doing what you're doing now. You know, I can and indeed. So myself and the co-founder of the company, Dr. John Reed, we were very interested in finding solutions for, for climate change. And so we were looking for uh, different types of solutions that may already exist. Can we commercialize them or solutions that hadn't been commercialized? And, uh, and we, sorry, for, sorry for interrupting you. So let me just ask oh, you, yeah. solutions for what? Like, what was your concern? I know you founded the company in 2008, but like, what was your concern? What were you seeking solutions for? We founded the company in 20, uh, we found a Kiverti in 2011. Oh, 2011. Um, okay. We were, Thank you for the correction. We were very, we started working on climate solutions in 20, 2008, as you mentioned. Uh, and it was just, how do you, how do we get this uh, carbon emissions, this, this uh, amount of CO2 that we're producing and in, in putting into the air? How do we reduce that? How do we combat climate change? How do we not uh, warm the earth and see the devastating consequences. Uh, and so for us, we know that NGOs definitely have a role in that, a role to play. Governmental bodies, policymakers, regulatory bodies, they all have a role to play. Uh, and, you know, my business background kind of taught me that business can uh, have a role to play as well. And so we started working on how do you remake supply chains so that they're more sustainable? Uh, that's really cool. So you are sitting there, you're concerned about climate change, you're concerned about emissions and sustainability. How did you come across the idea, though, to make protein from air? Yes. Well, very carefully. <laughs> but, but in particular, uh, the scientists at NASA during the 60s and 70s during the space program uh, were trying to figure out how do you get humans to Mars? How do you feed those humans for that trip? How do you do things uh, in a way that allows for a successful and sustainable journey? And one of the, the problems that they thought about was how do you, how do you feed uh, astronauts? Uh, and so one of the ideas that they came up with in addition to, of course, growing crops and trying to figure out how to make those crops more efficient was to use uh, single-celled organisms as a way to uh, grow food. Uh, and that was their original concept. Uh, but unfortunately, we haven't yet gone to Mars. So that did not turn into a commercial solution of any sort. So when myself and uh, Dr. John Ree were looking at uh, how can we recycle carbon in a way to turn into something of value, we saw in particular, and as people know, the current food system creates more greenhouse gases 
than the entire transportation sector, than our cars, our planes, our trains, and our trucks combined. And so it's a huge greenhouse gas emitter. Uh, and it's actually super inefficient. Uh, it, it takes two years, two to three years to make a steak, essentially, to grow a steak using, uh, I would say, old, outdated technology, using cows mm. that, are, that are very resource intensive uh, and very inefficient. And so going to the thought experiment of an astronaut traveling in space, there's a need to be very resource efficient. In that case, you have minimal resources and you have minimal space and you have to figure out how to grow food. Um, so we've developed a technology that is able to use elements of the air that we breathe, the carbon dioxide, uh, as an input to uh, what we call a probiotic production process. But it's actually very similar to making yogurt, uh, but the output is protein. Fascinating. So uh, I want to talk more about how you're doing it, obviously not giving away any proprietary secrets that you have, but I know that you are a multiple patent holder and that those patents are public. So I'm hoping we can talk a little bit about for, for a layperson how you're doing it. But, you know, the idea strikes me that this is one more way in which NASA is not just helping to make space travel more likely, but is making life here on Earth better too. In fact, if you think about like the cultivated meat industry, and you now have like more than 40 companies out there that are growing real meat from animal cells, uh, you know, this was all pioneered by NASA for space travel. You know, the first ever uh, research that was ever conducted that grew real meat outside of an animal's body was funded by NASA for the purpose of basically you know, cosmic tourism. Like if we're going to go long distances, we're obviously not going to be carrying Noah's Ark in tow. And so if, if astronauts are going to eat meat, they're going to have to grow it. And, uh, there yeah. was, and, and so there were people who, like you, looked at this NASA research and thought, that seems like really cool technology, but you know, that's awesome for space, but we need that here on earth. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's how you have now 20 years later, like all these companies like Memphis meets and others doing, doing what they're doing. It's pretty amazing. So, uh, my hat is off to you for yeah. looking at this old research from NASA and, and finding, uh, more modern applications for it. But how does it actually work, Lisa? You know, you're taking, uh, the air and there are certain uh, components of the air that you're subjecting, I presume, to a type of fermentation? Something very similar to fermentation, exactly. And just a quick comment on the, the NASA piece is that we definitely all stand on the shoulders of giants. And definitely there were some uh, really great thinkers back in the day that that have developed concepts that many people in many different fields have, have leveraged to create technologies. Uh, and in particular, as we were thinking about this, this climate change issue and just the technologies that we use that, that got us into this, you really have to think outside the box. Mm. And what better place to think outside the box than to think about being on a spaceship? <laughs> so just wanted to, to comment on that. You're, you're, but thinking yeah, so both, take, you're going to think both outside the box and outside the whole, the entire planet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And we can think of the earth as our spaceship. And so yes. in that case, how do we grow things in a way that uses minimal resources, does not emit all these greenhouse gases and mm. uh, is sustainable? So. So yeah, um, in, in terms of the process itself, so we definitely, it's it's very similar to making yogurt or brewing beer. Uh, so you have a fermentation vessel and you have a starter culture in that fermentation vessel. And the difference is that our culture uses carbon dioxide uh, and, you know, as, as an element of the air and other things as its, as its input. We use renewable power uh, to split water. We have some other inputs, micronutrients, uh, and then we're able to make protein instead of making yogurt. And then to turn that protein into meat, we apply pressure and, and temperature and different culinary techniques to get the right texture and the flavor uh, to create the, the different um, things that consumers are looking for, the different sensations, the, the flavors, the taste, et cetera. So is, is your technology taking microbes and feeding them CO2 and then they convert into this type of protein or is it more like they are emitting that type of protein as like their byproduct of their digestion, so to speak? Yeah, we make protein, the microorganisms are synthesizing amino acids directly from the inputs that we're feeding mm -hmm. uh, those microorganisms. And it's the protein that we then use as the building block to make the structured and flavored meat analog. Are, are those microorganisms in the final product or are they the byproduct of that, of the microorganism? It's the protein. We, we focus on yeah. growing the microbes uh, to make protein in particular. Okay, cool. And I don't know how to pronounce it. So tell me the category of microbes that these are. I know that they are, these are like some extremophile uh, microbes. Is that correct? 
oxyhydrogen. These are oxyhydrogen uh, microorganisms that we use. Okay. And they're in nature. They're found in nature. And in the places where you find them, they are nature's local carbon uh, transformation engines. They, they serve to feed those local ecosystems. All right, cool. So we're talking about things like microbes that would be existing around hydrothermal vents and places that are um, in nature that aren't the customary for what we would find ourselves enjoying, right? There's many places where you'd find them, but they're what we typically uh, do use in food production processes, you know, whether it's our yeast or the microbes that you use for making yogurt or for making cheese, they like a fixed form of carbon, shall we say, like sugar or milk, a mm. uh, fixed form of carbon. And so these are a different type of microorganisms that do like CO2 inorganic carbon as their input. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll just quickly note that that's very much like growing a soybean. <laughs> <laughs> soybean also uses carbon dioxide pulled from the air, mm. uh, just like our process. And uh, soybean then needs an a energy source. In that case, it's going to be solar energy for photosynthesis. In our case, it's going to be renewable power. Uh, and they need a place to grow. In um, the case of soybeans, it's going to be soil. In our case, it's going to be a fermentation vessel. And they just need time. In the case of soybeans, it's going to be months. In our case, it's going to be, you know, hours, 96 or so hours. Mm. Uh, and then you're able to get the product on the, on the back end and then fashion that into a meat analog using different culinary techniques. Very cool. So let's talk about that then. Uh, you know, obviously we know that consuming soybeans directly is far, far, far more efficient than feeding them to animals and then eating those animals. Um, but is your process of making air protein even more efficient than a soybean then? It sounds like on a time perspective, you're saying it is, I presume on a, on a land and water use it is, but tell us what you think about that. Yeah, definitely going from the old outdated technology of, of, of using cows to make protein to using things like soy to make protein reduces the amount of land and water required. But and and that's a good direction to go in. And then we're taking it the next step and using a process that does not require any arable land, any agricultural land at all. Um, and the overall footprint, no matter where you put the production, the probiotic production process is much smaller. And so the uh, comparison is uh, it would take a soy farm the size of Texas to give you the same amount of protein as you'd get from an air protein farm the size of Walt Disney World. Huh. So significant land reduction. And we believe that that's required as we anticipate that there's going to be 10 billion people on this planet. So again, this is our spaceship and our crew is growing. So there's going to be 10 billion people on the planet. So how do we feed all these people without using so much land? Wow. What's your primary motivation? I know you're concerned about climate change, but is it feeding 10 billion people? Are you concerned about wildlife extinction? Is it animal welfare? Like what drives you, Lisa, to want to do this? All of the above. Okay. So if we look at... The 2019, we look at the Amazon, there were record fires in the Amazon, and a significant fraction of that was to make room for cattle grazing. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of species that potentially have gone extinct and actually have. We, we know that there's this massive extinction of, of this, this the, create, the creatures that live on this planet, you know, whether they're, soy, they're um, plant creatures or animals or insects or what have you, we're actually removing their habitat uh, at an alarming rate. So that's, that's a problem, of course. And we see the effects of climate change now. Once in one, you know, the, the types of storms that would happen once in 100 years are happening more frequently. There's extended drought seasons, which are leading to these massive fires and, and people are being affected. People are losing their homes or in some cases losing their lives. And so this is something that's affecting us today and it's only going to get worse. So these are things that that drive me and drive many people on my team. Uh, and so our uh, role in this is to try to figure out solutions. Mm -hmm. And so to try to create processes and in particular the food process that is much more sustainable, uses much land, does not emit all these greenhouse gases that we have with our current food system and uses less water. I love it. So speaking of your team, Lisa, I know you said that you founded the company about uh, nine or so years ago. How big is your team now? And if you are public about it, how much have you guys raised? Yeah, Air Protein was born last year. Um, uh, so we are based in Pleasanton, California, um, and Cuverti was born in 2011. Uh, and so we are, with Air Protein, really focused on scaling up production, and we will be opening up a new round of financing in this year and talking to many investors about it. Um, yeah. 
So uh, let me ask you, Lisa, have you, I, I know that you are taking outside investors for people who, who may want to own a piece of your company. At the same time, though, uh, how have you um, funded in the past with research grants? Like, are you receiving any state or federal assistance to help uh, bring your company to commercialization? Yeah, so we've been funded by our wonderful investors um, that have invested in building an amazing technology that can do a bunch of different things. And we're, we're so happy that they're on board with us. Um, as you mentioned, lots of grants have been a part of our history, as part of our story uh, from every, you know, many different organizations from the U.S. Department of Energy to the California Energy Commission to um, Iowa to a, a Canadian government and a bunch of different sources. Uh, and more importantly for us, uh, it's corporate partners. So we have corporate partners that are working with us and to remake supply chains. And so that's kind of a really important uh, part of our story and a part of our growth and our expansion. One of the things that uh, people who follow plant-based diets sometimes uh, have to supplement with is B12, but uh, apparently your air protein, Lisa, has um, uh, some B12 naturally occurring in it. Is that correct? We are able to synthesize B12 naturally. Mm -hmm. Yes. We're actually able to synthesize lots of different things naturally with this technology that we've developed. It's kind of amazing. Uh, you know, we focus on these different long chain molecules like vitamins and proteins and those types of things with, with this uh, process. Yeah, that's really cool. So um, my understanding is that what you're doing, like obviously there's a meat analog component to it, but that you can make um, analogs for lots of things, including even perhaps palm oil. Is that something that you guys are focused on is trying to create a more sustainable palm oil replacement? Air protein is 100% focused on protein and making food in a more sustainable way. And our initial products will be you know, everything from beef analogs or non-animal beef, shall mm -hmm. we call it, mm -hmm. uh, non-animal chicken sources, non-animal poultry, broadly speaking, as well as seafood and pork and those types of things. So we're going after many of the different protein sources. But I think your broader question is, what's the power and the potential of the technology that we've developed? And yes, the power and potential goes beyond protein and the ability to make different types of oils, uh, oils that can be a part of a complete uh, product that we make, a complete meat product, um, oils that can be used in industry in a number of different ways in the food industry. There's oils that we find in our salad dressings, dressings. there's oils that we find in you know, our baked goods. And so, yes, the power of this technology goes well above and beyond uh, protein. What's the cost? Um, uh, you know, obviously, when you look at renewable energy, right, we see solar has gone way down in cost. Uh, when we're looking even at cultivated meat now, the first burger that was debuted back in 2013 by Dr. Mark Post had a price tag of around 300,000 US dollars. Now it's a tiny little sliver fraction of that cost. Um, you know, you have companies like Just that are saying that they can, you know, make chicken nuggets for less than $100 per nugget now uh, from chicken cells. Um, for you, I presume you're continually focused on bringing the cost of your products uh, down. I know you're not yet on the market, but how close are you, do you think, to having something that could be cost competitive, let's say, with other um, plant proteins? like whether it's pea protein or, or other types of uh, plant proteins out there or even animal proteins? Yeah, we've done the assessments, the economic assessments with third parties uh, and spent a lot of time focused on those technical metrics that are necessary to hit in order to have an economically attractive protein. And since this is, you know, very similar to your typical fermentation, those are going to be things like how, what is the productivity? Um, how much product are you making uh, per you know unit of, of volume? It's going to be things like what is the yield of your product uh, as a function of what you put in, uh, as well as the concentration. And so we spent uh, the last few years really focused on trying to hit those those metrics that would make this lower cost than other options at scale. And happily last year, we hit all those metrics. So uh, the reason why we're focused now and scaling up is because we've hit all the metrics, the, the scientific metrics that are needed in order to make this more uh, economically attractive than the alternative protein sources at scale. That's awesome. When do you think that you might try to commercialize your first products? 
That's a good question. Announcements, TBD. All right, all right, <laughs> the all right. announcements are coming soon, but um, you know we we're happy last year to announce that we made the world's first air-based chicken, uh, and you know happy to talk to people about it to show people um, we've made a bunch of different types of products, uh, meat analogs. We'll be making announcements here soon, um, but working uh, on the scaling process, as you can imagine, making air-based protein and air-based meat doesn't happen overnight, and we've been working away at it and we'll be making announcements about our commercialization t- commercialization timeline in the not too distant future. I would imagine it doesn't happen overnight, but apparently, according to you, it happens in about 96 hours. So uh, <laughs> hopefully uh, over a few nights, you'll be able to uh, to make it. So I, I saw at least the photos of your air-based chicken, which looked quite delectable. But um, you know, for an ingredient deck, like how would the FDA require you to label this as an ingredient um, when if, if I go out and I'm going to be, I want to be that first customer to get air protein chicken, what do I see on the ingredient list? You know, that's a really wonderful question. It's a great question. And I don't have the answer that I am able to talk about now. I can tell you what we what we are pushing for right. and lobbying for. But I think that the analog is going to be yogurt. Yogurt are made, is made out of a similar type of process. And what you see on the back of a, um, a, 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 a um, carton or of yogurt is going to be the name of the different species that that, that created that yogurt. Hmm. Uh, even corn, uh, Q U O R N, that company, uh, they're making protein-based products using a similar type of process. Again, not using you know elements of the air like we do, but using a fermentative type process. In that case, is mycoprotein. Uh, you know, and the list can go on and on. You know, cheese, uh, et cetera. Uh, a lot of things are made with the, with a fermentation type of process. And so, there's many models out there, and we of course have our our, our hope of what will end up on the back of the the label. Um, but I think that independent of what ends up there, uh, this the products that we make will come with their amazing sustainability story. We believe this is the most sustainable way to make protein, significantly less land, you know, GHG intensity of water. And, you know, we're focusing on nutrition as well, high health, high nutrition. And of course it has to taste great. And, and that is, will be, and continues to be a focus of ours as well. Yeah, you know, uh, my understanding is that corn it really invented the term mycoprotein because no one knows what mycelium is. And when I, I actually buy corn pretty regularly, and I think that what the ingredient deck says is mycoprotein, and then there's an asterisk, and then somewhere else on the box it says this is fusarium, which is a you know a member of the mold part of the fungus family or something like that. Um, but I think on their label it doesn't say the species, which is fusarium, uh, actually on the ingredient deck. I think they have this special name. Um, so, you know, if that is a model, maybe air protein actually becomes something that, you know, is a uh, is an ingredient that would be recognized. Although I don't know what FDA would say about that, um, but it sounds pretty cool. Thank you. Yes. So how many people approximately do you think have consumed your air protein so far? Is it less than 100 or more than 100, do you think? You know, we're scaling up and we will scale up. <laughs> and when we do, we'll have, you know, people will be, we'll have teaser events, taster events. And the focus of us, of, of our company now is scaling. Yeah, that's what doesn't exist in the world. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's air-based protein, so. Well, I will, uh, I'll look forward to hopefully getting to be one of those people who gets to eat it since I would be, uh, I'd be very happy to get a chance to uh, be one of the world's first consumers of it. I would love that. Um, so, uh, keep me posted, Lisa. That would be will. pretty awesome. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Wonderful. You know, when people are looking at you, Lisa, they see like you have this very illustrious background. Um, you, you know, are obviously you know, doing something really, really cool that might um, dramatically improve the world, enlighten humanity's footprint on the planet, and maybe even have ramifications for us beyond our own planet. Um, if somebody is thinking, I'd really like to be like Lisa, I'd like to do something with my life that is going to help me start my own company and do something to reduce the impacts of climate change or something like that. Are there any resources that you think that would be helpful for them that you would recommend, whether books or anything else that you would offer? Thank you, first of all, for those kind words. And um, so if someone out there is looking to start a company uh, and build a business around their solution 
that they've they're uh, passionate about to um, bring about change in the world, then there are some resources that I would recommend. Um, I am a fan of Patrick Lencioni and his series of books. Um, so everything from the classic Five Dysfunctions of a Team uh, to the uh, Death by Meeting. So you know that of course teaches. Uh, people how to have meetings that are effective and kind of talks about the importance of meetings. Many meetings are not effective and they're not a good use of time. So things, you know, that's a good book and the advantage uh, as well. One of his books uh, is about organizational health and how to make sure that everybody on your team is aligned on the mission and purpose of your company and what your, uh, what success looks like, um, et cetera. So I, I definitely in general recommend his series of books, and he has a number of them. And, and I like all the ones that I've read. And, and another uh, book would be Who, just W-H-O, and it's by Jeff Smart. And the importance of this book is, is you know, it's all about the team. So if someone has an invention, has an idea, uh, then that's kind of really important. But execution is, is critical. So it's all about who you bring on the team and making sure everyone is aligned with your mission, your goals, everyone is in the right seat. And I think that's a great book that talks about that. And we have a, a wonderful team that, uh, you know, are, are really passionate about uh, sustainability and they bring that passion to their work and they do such a wonderful job. And I'm honored to be on the team with them. So I'd, I'd recommend that book as well. That's great. And what a last name that Jeff Smart has. I wonder who is the first person in their family to say, ah, this is going to be our name. It's, it's definitely a good <laughs> name. But yeah, I mean, that whole idea um, about execution is something I think about a lot because I've noticed that there are a lot of entrepreneurs who I know who are, you know, they don't want to um, tell people what their idea is because they're afraid somebody else is going to do it as if, you know, mm -hmm. if I had had the idea to have a supercomputer in your pocket that I might have stolen it from Apple, right? You know, like you have to know how to actually execute and make a smartphone in order to do that. And, um, you know, if I had said, oh, I, that sounds cool, I'm going to make protein from the air. Well, you have to actually execute it. So even if someone else had known about this idea, you know, what you're doing is, is really the execution. It's not just the idea. And so uh, I'm, I'm always uh, encouraging people to really uh, think about talking about their ideas in the hopes that they can actually manifest them and actualize them as opposed to just holding up ideas in, in their own minds since execution really is what actually matters in, in this world, I think. It is critical. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, speaking of execution and ideas, you're obviously focused on doing air protein right now. So I imagine that someone who has as much mental capacity as you do probably has thought about other companies that you hope would exist that you're not pursuing that would help make the world a better place. So are there any other ideas, Lisa, that you would suggest that entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs are out there listening to you right now that you hope they'll pursue that might do, make some good in the world? There are so many issues that need solving, and a lot of them could be solved by entrepreneurs. There's many different ways to solve the issues that we have. Um, one issue for me is is the projection that there's going to be more plastic in the ocean than fish by 2050, and that's that's kind of scary. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. We we do have a plastic waste problem, so we need uh, entrepreneurs, we need companies, we need governmental bodies, we need everyone. And, and since this is for entrepreneurs, uh, we need them to come up with new ideas on how to solve that problem. Everything from ways to aggregate plastic waste to upcycling it into value to making products that don't require plastic. Uh, so there's a number of different types of businesses that can be built around addressing that issue. But I'd say that that's one of the issues that I think we we need to, to figure out how to tackle. Yeah, uh, for sure. I, I think that in so many of these problems, there are great business opportunities and um, uh, plastic collection, plastic degradation. So, you know, degrading the plastics that we currently have or creating plastics that are biodegradable um, already so that when they, you know, actually enter a waterway that they degrade rather than remain. Um, all of those seem like really great business ideas. And so I hope yeah. that, that somebody will, will figure out some way, but for sure, we've got to yeah, figure out something to do with these billions of tons of plastic that are already uh, choking our waterways and, and much of the planet right now. 
Exactly. And what we need in particular is a new supply chain that's built around biodegradable materials. The existing supply chain is is not built around uh, biodegradable materials. And so it's really hard to change it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, change change in general is hard. Um, but we need entrepreneurs to, that can come along and kind of remake those supply chains, as it were, and create more products, more demand on the downstream for the biodegradable goods uh, so that different companies can start producing biodegradable material. I mean, if you think about it, with all these plastics in the oceans, I mean, some of them are eaten by fish and then we eat the fish and lo and behold, you end up with uh, residue, plastic residue and and breast milk. So it's really a problem that is important for our health, for the health of our planet and for the health of individuals that we need to address. For sure. Yeah, I've thought a lot about like this question of, you know, what would, if this is the issue you want to tackle, like, is it better to create the the plastics of the future that won't be so bad or to figure out what to do with all the plastic we already have now and have to do something with. And in some ways, it's it's almost like on the greenhouse gas emissions, like, do you want to create renewable energy that is going to wean us off of the emissions that we have that we're spewing into the plant into the atmosphere right now? Um, Or do you want to focus on removing CO2 from the atmosphere? You know, you have uh, companies like Global Thermostat that are uh, trying to find ways just to suck CO2 straight out of the atmosphere. Do you have any thoughts on that as a climate expert yourself, as some, as, as what you would do, (laughs) what you would view? Like, are, are you familiar with Global Thermostat? Oh, yes, definitely. Absolutely. So we had their founder, uh, Graciela Chichoninsky, on the show a little while ago, and she, she made this case that basically, even if we stopped all emissions right now, that we would still have too much CO2 in the atmosphere and would still have to suck it out because even with no net new emissions, we're we're really in in deep water here. So literally actually in deep water. So uh, what do you think? Do you agree with with that approach or uh, what's your thought on it? Yeah, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think there's strong arguments for for both. And and you're talking about specifically carbon you capture and in some cases, utilization, in some cases, sequestration, and at the same time, renewable power for for future, um, to power future processes uh, and to have more renewable uh, ways of producing things in the future. And so I think we need both because the world doesn't stop tomorrow. So how are we going to get energy tomorrow? So we need renewable power for that energy. And we have CO2, a CO2 issue today. Um, so I think they're both this needed. Same thing for plastics. You know, we have plastic waste that is in the ocean. So let's come up with ways of using that, um, capturing it, uh, you know, in some cases, um, you know, disposing of it, recycling it, whatever we're going to do. And then people are consuming things, things are being uh, produced. Uh, so when we're producing something for tomorrow, uh, let's make sure that we have a high percentage of things that are biodegradable. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Uh, one final question for you, Lisa, that I was wondering, um, you're starting with air-based chicken. Uh, as, as you know, chicken is, um, you know, much cheaper than beef. And so this is one, I, I think one reason why some of the plant-based meat and our companies are focused on because it's easier to compete on cost with beef than with chicken. Why start with chicken? <laughs> yeah, our platform is, is broader than that. I think you're saying we're starting from chicken because that's what we announced uh, last year. Is that the rationale? Yeah, presuming it's true. I mean, presuming that's what you're going to start okay. with. I mean, I, I don't okay. know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, our platform is is broad. Um, we're, you know, with this type of technology, we intend on making air-based beef, air-based pork, air-based seafood, air-based chicken. Um, you know, we are creating a, the new type of food company and particularly the new type of meat uh, company. So, um, you know, it's definitely broader than that. I think with chicken, though, if we want to you know, go deeper into chicken. One of the focus, a key focus of our business is focusing on nutrition and health and chicken is uh, perceived to be one of the, uh, the healthier meats. Um, and there's been a, a trend that's been happening for quite a while of meat eaters shifting from eating beef and pork to chicken for health reasons. We're seeing an additional trend that's happening now, which are people, people shifting from, from beef, um, particularly in, in other meats, uh, for environmental reasons. Uh, and so chicken is actually a great platform to start in that we can demonstrate that we're making something that is focused on nutrition, focused on health, uh, and 
super sustainable, the most sustainable way to make a protein a product, uh, including meat, and also uh, flavorful, very tasty. So chicken is a great place to start for those reasons. Well, that's really cool. Now, when somebody asks you, what does air protein taste like? You can say, tastes like chicken. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and also from an animal welfare perspective, of course, um, you know, switching from beef to chicken has really bad effects because not only are chickens typically treated in, in ways that are much worse than cows are, but uh, there's just a lot, you need a lot more of them. So, uh, you know, if somebody from an animal welfare perspective is seeking to prevent the number of, an to reduce the number of animals who are being raised and slaughtered for food, uh, you know, switching to chicken dramatically increases the number of animals who have to be raised for food. And so to the extent that you're creating an alternative to that, of course, it's good for the reasons you're noting, but it's also especially good for animal welfare as well. So Lisa, there are a lot of chickens who are out there rooting for your success. And uh, as somebody who loves chickens, as amazing, the amazing animals they are, I also am rooting for your success. And I'm really grateful for what you're doing and Thank can't you. wait to become a customer of yours. Thank you. Really great talking to you, Paul. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me on your show. Thanks for listening. We hope you found use in this episode. If so, don't keep it to yourself. Please leave us a five-star rating on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. And as always, we hope you will be in the business of doing good.